Good evening. Um, we have pondered this talk for quite a while. Um, actually, Rob tried to, to have this talk on what the heck, but it somehow didn't happen. We lost the war as the title because we feel that somehow we need to mention the fact that we actually lost the war. We lost the war for privacy. We lost the war for free internet, maybe. We lost the war against the surveillance industry, at least for now. So we won a few battles. We prevented the clipper chip quite a while ago. We managed to keep Germany at least an island of privacy in Europe. Um, but that's about it. And we think it's about time that we talk about this, that we think about why we have lost, what can be done, what is the situation now, and what follows from that, based on that we have some kind of foresight where the, the travel goes, where we'll end up, and what the technology is that will be used uh, to keep an eye on us. So essentially, this talk has two phases. One is we look at the situation, where we will be in two years, where we are right now, what can we, what can be seen in terms of tendency uh, of police state, of surveillance state, um, what technology will be upon us within a short time frame, and then try to develop ideas what can be done about that. So how we can stay relevant, how we can stay in a position to influence society to the better, and how to keep somehow a position where we are not completely helpless. So claiming that this is not the case and everything will be fine again is obviously not, not possible anymore. Okay, there are some risks and, and potential benefits of this talk. As Frank said, uh, first we'll look at the situation now and we're going to try to convince at least some portion of you that this is not, what we're seeing right now is not the normal swing of things. It's not, well, you know, you win some, you lose some, that there are really some fundamental things changing, about to change, and have changed in the world around us. Um, and then the second part is trying to think, as, as already mentioned, trying to think about what's going to happen next. Now, the main risk is that we'll do really well on the first part, convincing you all that doom is upon us, and then we'll fail miserably on the second part of figuring out what to do about it, so you'll all be very demotivated, won't feel like doing anything about it, and everything will be much worse than when we started. Um, some of this material can be quite depressing, and I mean that quite literally. I was very, very, very depressed for the past two years as this all started happening in Holland. I'll come back to why Holland has been specifically depressing over the past few years later. Um, let me see here. Uh, we're going to be doing this relatively, relatively quickly. We're going to have a lot to talk about, and we want some audience participation. We'd like to have 15 or 20 minutes left at the end, so we can try to get ideas, try to, to hear what people think are positive models for changing what's going on. But we'll get to that much later. Okay. Okay. Um, the situation now. Basically, we are inside the future that we always had in these dark sci-fi novels that we never wanted, that we speculated sometimes about when the winter was especially dark and uh, we were already in a bit depressed mood. And then we thought about how it would be the police state, the state that knows everything about us, um, the corporations that are basically part of the state entity. And we are there now. It's not a future anymore. It's not like a sci-fi movie or something like that. We are there now. And we need to live with that and think about what follows from that and what can be done. The logic behind everything is the politicians and the people who are really in power today have a view of the world that is entirely pessimistic. They see the crises that are on the horizon. They see that we have a climate change coming up. It's undeniable, meanwhile, which will mean that millions of people need to relocate, that vast areas of land will be not usable anymore, that huge amounts of real estate will not be insurable anymore because it will be below sea level. So we see that the, the change, changes of globalization have led to something that can no longer be sustained in the Western society in terms of labor for all. That was yesterday. So 
we are just in the phase where the politicians don't really want to acknowledge that there is simply is not enough labor anymore for everybody, but this is already the case. And so they need to prepare for that. They need to prepare in some sort of, I don't know what, what their mindset is about that, um, for a state where two thirds of the population will have no meaningful labor, but something that maybe earns their rent, but only maybe. So they see that immigration pressure is there, that a lot of people want to come to the West because it's even as worse as it has become, is even much better than the rest of the world. And so as cl uh, climate catastrophe strikes in Africa, we will have huge immigration pressure onto Europe. So also what we see is the energy crisis, peak oil is there. So we can talk about if it's maybe five years or 10 years, but the end of fossil energy is there, which means that the society will need to develop alternatives very fast. And if that doesn't happen, then dis the disruptions will be severe. So uh, we also see that there are disruptive technologies on the horizon. So if you think of nanotechnology, we will have a talk about here, or if you think about uh, what follows on from the development of DNA technology, um, this can be hugely disruptive for society. So what we see today under the banner of fight against terrorism is nothing but preparation for an even darker future in the minds of the people who govern us. So this future does not need to be as dark, but that's what they prepare for and that's what they, in part, at least aiming for. So in the end, we will have a never-ending state of emergency. There will always be some terror on demand that keeps up the fear. There will always be the next big scare that justifies the next law to further reduce our freedoms. There will always be some kind of technology that they don't really understand and that they would want to limit or keep under their control. And so today's tool for shaping a society is this terror on demand. The next tool that will come from them is data mining, meaning that optimization of society in ways that we cannot imagine today that maybe in novels like Gattaca have been pictured this will ha really happen. This is what is our future now. So our future is a nicely colored, friendly, fully automated police state. It will be not really intrusive. If you have nothing to hide, then you should not be bothered, but it will be there. And it will end development society, uh, the development of society as we know it today, if we don't find a way to, to go up against that. So the, the scope of technology as we as we have it today in terms of surveillance, in terms of data mining, in terms of profiling, is virtually unlimited. If it does not work today because the data, l amount of data is too vast, it will certainly work in 10 years. If you look at the development of technology if, and say, okay, there is no way to store all email traffic because it's much too much data, that might be the case today. In 10 years, it will be available for sure as commercial technology. So. Um, Pointing to this technology does not work or that technology does not work does not really help us because we can already see that it will work in the near future. And even if some particular technology like biometry fails entirely because for principal reasons, there are enough other alternatives for identification that they will use. If biometry fails, they will simply go for directly for DNA ident identification, which will be the next big wealth there. And it's all is possible because democracy is essentially deprecated. If you look at the European Union, we are not really governed in certain areas of policy anymore by our parliaments. We are governed by directives that are dealt out in back rooms by people who are not even elected. This is the case today. So we are not governed by anything that resembles democracy at all. So it looks like democracy, people can debate, which is nice, that's why we're here sitting here, and we re retain certain freedoms, but the real decisions are not made anymore in a dem democratic way. And where it all ends is that the state is able to prosecute people he doesn't like selectively. So there will be no more thing called justice, because if everything that you do is known at some point in some database and available for automatic policing, which is the end goal, then somebody or some algorithm can choose to prosecute you or not. And Rob can tell from Netherlands that it's already starting. 
Yeah. Um, I'm not sure many of you have been following the news in Holland, uh, at least not maybe in the same level of detail. You've seen the big events that have been happening. People have been mostly very surprised at what's been going on in Holland. Um, I'll go a little bit into it. There's a longer story. Uh, basically, through the 80s and 90s, we've had a couple of hidden crises. Holland was doing economically very well. We've had natural gas. Um, but there's been a hidden crisis in education. There's been a hidden crisis um, in immigration. There's been a hidden crisis. There's been a lot of, of, of events going on in Holland. And we've had, uh, through the 90s, we've had something very comparable to what's been happening here in Germany politically very recently. We've had a very broad coalition in politics. And because the coalition was very broad and because it was meant to exclude the Christian Democrats, it was formed around them, everything had to be agreed upon in back rooms. And because it had to be agreed upon beforehand, the whole political process in Holland over the late 90s basically died. This made, made room for a political movement that was sort of right-wing opportunistic, that came to power with Pim Fortuyn, even though he was personally shot at the time his party came to power in 2002, which basically spiraled Dutch politics into a wave of craziness that is still going on right now. Um, as it is, and as it probably always has been, the Dutch are the most scared nation in Europe. Uh, this is possibly contrary to our reputation, but the Dutch score highest on any fear, except for the fears that are really irrelevant in Holland, such as earthquakes, uh, of any population in the world based on standardized questions. Um, what this leads to is a population that is screaming for more control as, as this whole fear of terror, as, as many of you may know, the Dutch are part of the coalition of the coerced, and as such, we're in Iraq, together with our American friends. Uh, so everybody's completely uh, scared of terrorism, and the population is basically screaming for more control. Cameras are going up in streets, uh, police cameras. Uh, there's one particular street that I'm uh, a little bit involved in, and they have a camera every 100 meters. And then you look at, at the, the citizens meeting for that part of town, and people are upset that their street is not getting one. There's like huge uproar over these cameras because they want cameras in their streets as well. Um, what's going on right now? Uh, many of you have followed that uh, the chiefs of police in England want a system for every car, all car movements, every car passage to be registered, license plates to be read automatically in one big database to be created and retained of all vehicle movements. Uh, the Dutch have gone further than that. The Dutch chiefs of police have released a strategy document about three or four months ago, and that strategy document said, the police needs to look at, store, and analyze, data mine, uh, all the data from all the infrastructural points where lots of people, money, uh, goods, information pass by. In other words, we need to be everywhere where there's lots of movement, and we need to store all of that in databases and start data mining it. Um, another interesting thing that's going on in Holland is a policy which is in Dutch is called Tegenhouden. Gegenwirken, to frustrate. In other words, we don't no longer want to prosecute crime, but the police wants to pursue an active uh, policy of frustrating criminals. In other words, if we think you're a criminal, we're just going to inspect your car every time you drive. If you, we think you're a criminal, we're just going to inspect your taxes every two months, and we're going to come by your house to see if it fits the building code every two weeks until you go away, until you go live somewhere else. Um, the two fit together. If you data mine, you get a lot of fuzzy data. You get a lot of data that may point to you being nasty, but there's no real facts associated with it. Your communication pattern fits the pattern of the data mining algorithm probably doesn't even tell you why we don't like you. We just know that we don't. Uh, now, think of how, mon how much of our lives is already governed by chance. If your income is within such a bandwidth of the income of other people in your uh, class of, of, of whatever register, whatever tax register, if your income is within that bandwidth, then your chance of being inspected is 1.2 times higher than normal. But normal is already throwing the dice. It's already made by chance. If you were able to flip the database, if you were able to up the chances for somebody to be inspected at any given time by 70% or, or or lower the chance of 70% of somebody being inspected, then your, your life would basically become either very easy or completely impossible. 
But the people doing it would never even know. Well, sir, we're just sent here because the computer says we have to go here. So why is this phone beeping all the time? Shut up. Um, so think about this some more and think about how data mining and this, this new form of policing go together and, and, and you can create a system even, at least theoretically and, and I think practically, you can create a system where you can make people's lives impossible without ever involving humans that would have to do the actual dirty work. Yeah, this, this automatic policing is what every policeman dreams about. So that there is no means to escape anymore, that there is no small crime that goes undetected, that all the little violations that uh, basically make our life livable today are being prosecutable at one point. And so this is where we are heading. So we might be able to delay here and there, we might be able to win a battle here and there for because somebody might see the light, um, but essentially this is the direction where we're going. And we are basically headed for a new dark ages that will take some time, maybe only a few years, maybe a few decades, we don't know at this point. It essentially depends on how much fear can be put into the population without them waking up and without the elite that governs the, uh, the countries thinking about, okay, is this the right way to do it? So why did we lose? That we won't elaborate too much on that, on that thing because I think it's, it's painfully obvious we had no plan B for a September 11 case, simply the very moment these planes crashed into the World Trade Center, we had already lost, so there was no way around that. So political lobbying alone um, was simply not enough against the full force uh, of the security industrial complex that we are basically headed up against. Uh, the intelligence agencies and their commercial partners um, had, had their stuff together, the plans were already in the locker, so the very moment this, this thing happened, they just needed to pull out the plans. This has been shown for basically every country on this planet that they had the plans already done. Um, we had none, zero. So we focused on the, the technical problems of the surveillance infrastructure sometimes saying, okay, this technology just does not work, that technology does not work, stuff like that. This is simply not enough. This will not, will not, will not help us anymore. And we also did not really want it to, to be true. We did not really think about this could be the case, this could really happen, this is something that is not just science fiction but could be our reality. We simply did not want it to, to be. So actually we, we were not prepared, we had no chance at that point, and so we lost. So what now? Um, when we think about the greater shape of things, the essential point now is to maintain the breathing space in society, maintaining the ability to move, to change, to ask questions, to get answers, to know how things work, and not just for us, but for a lot of people. So there are quite a number of political groups out there of environmental activists, of human rights activists, and so on and so on, that are getting a broader base by the day because they're violations of basic human rights are getting more obvious also by the day. So it is not only just anymore for third world, world dictatorships that it's required to help political activists, but it's already for our own countries. We need to help the people that make change in society possible because they don't understand technology the way we do, but they have the cause and they have the political at least ideas to do something. And it's not really important what we support there as long as it's not some group that is aimed for totalitarianism or dictatorship. The real important thing is supporting change, supporting methods and breathing space for new ideas. So. Yeah. Should I continue? Yes. Um, We've sort of made a lot, of, a lot of chapters of things, of categories of things that we should do or thoughts that we had. Uh, of course, there's many more things that you could do. We've sort of made a list of, of, of what we felt was important. One of the things is that we realize things have changed, meaning we have to change too. 
a lot of our mantras, a lot of the things that we know to be true, um, uh, we have to very selectively look at again. Um, as long as we knee-jerk react to everything that happens around us, as long as we think that we already know what to say in every case somebody makes a move, uh, makes us vulnerable. Uh, if we aim too high, any retreat looks like we're losing. Uh, around myself, I see lots of people fighting battles for human rights, for freedom of speech, uh, and the, uh, the fact that they haven't been able to win for the past two or three years, that every battle that they fight is, 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 is lost, or at least a lot of the battles are lost, is demotivating people very quickly. So, given that activism has to be fun, or at least that's my personal view, and given that we have to uh, that we have to fight these battles with a motivated group of people, we have to pick our battles very carefully. We have to pick them based on what is important, which battles do we think we can actually win, and do these battles actually matter in the, in the bigger picture of things. We can't just go after everything. Um, no more fundamentalism. We have to very carefully look who's behind us, who's not behind us. So w one thing, we, we had this nice video surveillance debate for this Congress and uh, where we basically had the same issue. Technology has basically was faster than us. So cameras, I mean, were everywhere. When I just, when we just scroll back five years, we had an extremely tight photographing rule at the Congress. So basically everybody running around with the camera was basically nearly dead. And so, and today, uh, if I need to count the number of cameras that I have on me, I think I end up at four or something like that, counting all the telephones. And uh, we probably have, an, on average, 1.5 cameras here in this room per person. So um, things have changed. Technology has overtaken our fundamentalist stance. And so that's one example of what we need to think about, what is really worth protecting, what is the uh, the information, what is the, the principle that we need to protect here, and uh, can it really be protected given the, uh, the advance of technology? So we need to pick our battles also within foresight and what is happening in technology development. Very importantly is uh, seek technical fixes instead of waiting for political fixes. This has already always been a hacker mantra, but it's more important now than it has ever been. Uh, don't ever think that you can trust your government with data uh, if you can prevent them from having it in the first place. Don't ever think that... <laughs> so, as I said, this has always been true. It's always been one of our things, but it, it's, it's more important today than it's ever been. Uh, we need to continue building tools that are, can be used by political movements everywhere to fight oppression. Uh, as Frank said, it's not just third world dictatorships anymore. This is our own countries. We need to build crypto. We need to build it fast. Um, what did we mean here? Um, <coughs> we, we, we have one, one thing that we have learned from um, the peer-to-peer -peer groups, the file traders and wares traders. They are basically on the forefront of the battles that will be important to all of us because they feel the full pressure of what is technolo technological and political and legally possible today, meaning rights on the servers, people getting arrested for stuff that they have done online, stuff like that. So developing decentralized technology, technology that has no real the server that can be some by, somehow obtained or where a lot of people can be compromised, is something that is extremely important, as well as developing technology for anonymization that is ubiquitous, that is in everything. So we need, as, as well as we had, have already uh, opportunistic encryption on everything from email protocols to web browsing today, we need opportunistic anonymity. Because the one thing that the intelligence services and police agencies and oppression regimes of this planet really thrive on are traffic data. Data, who talks to whom, at what, point, uh, at what point and what volume. So that is the, the information that is really important. If you look, for instance, at the, what came out now uh, with the recent NSA scandals in the US, um, where 
it came out that the NSA was actively encouraging U.S. telecommunication companies to uh, funnel enough and or more traffic to the through U.S. switches so that the NSA could see all the traffic data and look for who has interesting communications patterns to then selectively tap these circuits. That's how they work. That's the, the basic mode of operation. So and from that, we need anonymity comes the next rule. It's don't compromise your friends with your stupidity. So if somebody chooses to act anonymously and you happen to know who he is, then respect his decision. If he really wants to act only under a well-chosen and well-protected screen name, then respect that, even if you know his real name. So And don't uh, compromise him by being sloppy with your encryption. So encryption works only if every party in the communication really cares for that. And caring for that is even more important now because everything is on file. So everything that you communicate today must be suspected to be on file for the next eternity. So everything that you do today matters for the rest of your life. And that's the, the mindset that you need to act on. So as I said, anonymity may become even more important than content security because that's the only way to get around be getting sus suspicion up on you. Um, if we build such technology, if such technology is deployed, uh, they will try to make that technology look like it's only useful for terrorists, it's only useful for child pornographers, it's only useful for criminals, it's only useful for money launderers, and we need to come up with positive stories. Uh, these positive stories need to get lots of attention. The human rights activists that use it, the environmental activists that use it, the cancer patient that needs the anonymity. These cases are real. There are people being fired for what they say on web blogs about their employers. There are whistleblowers. There are, we just need to find them and we just need to make sure that, that the anonymity and the cryptography technology that was part of the story becomes part of the story. Or if it wasn't part of the story, then it should be part of the story that it should have been. Um, another thing is to arm yourself. We know the technology, we know the surveillance infrastructure, we know how it works. Uh, find out more. Tell other people more. Yeah, we, there are one a bit uncomfortable reality is that a lot of us have basically sold their head. So a lot of us work now on the other side because after the bubble burst, the uh, really cool jobs that were not really ethically critical, became a bit scare. So Come to the dark side, Luke. So <laughs> and if it's not really the dark side, then maybe it's just gray or dark gray, grayish. So, and sometimes you realize only after a while what the technology that you're building on is really good for. So like video surveillance is something here that reduce criminality in here and there, um, or some new fancy algorithm for database searches might be good to optimize the SAP records, but also might be good for something entirely different. So we have actually quite a number of friends that work on the dark side now, and some of them have lost contact, have not contacted us anymore, or ceased to talk about what they're doing at work uh, because they have signed NDAs and stuff like that. And we need to break that. We need to talk to them again. We need to know what's going on there. We need to know precisely what the systems are capable of today, what they will be capable of tomorrow, and where the loopholes are. Because not getting caught is the real 50% of the mission now. Not getting caught, because we are too few to allow many of us getting caught. So we need to talk to them. We need to find ways to get onto the information, we need to enable people to anonymously submit information to us to get stuff to us that gets published. We need to be able to clean this information from any watermarking. We need to support people who stick out their neck like John Young with Cryptome um, that publish stuff and say, okay, I don't care, so sue me. We need more of them because these are the few light poles that will guide us through the dark. And the dark will be quite long, at least in my opinion. Okay, use humor. 
Humor is a great weapon. As I said, no, no more knee-jerk reactions, but, but it's better to give people one good laugh than to give them a, a completely predictable piece of, of activist reaction three or five times. Um, I personally very much like the Yes Men. I like Billionaires for Bush. Camera pieces in front of surveillance camera, or, or theater pieces in front of surveillance cameras, ad busting, performance art, flash mobs, anything that's that, that is unexpected, that sort of makes people trip over their own minds. And so we need to make the people on the other side of the camera feel bad. So they need to be embarrassed because they are peeping toms. They are the ones that spy on others. This is immoral what they're doing. They, we need to get them off that feeling that they are the good guys because they aren't. So. <laughs> So, and we need to laugh about them because it's really, it's a sick hobby to listen to other people's phone calls. And so, actually it's, it's not really something that you can be proud of. And this is something that we need to get into society. Being the peeping Tom at the surveillance equipment and developing such stuff must be embarrassing. It must be something that you really rather not feel good with and you should not have the feeling that you're the hero of Homeland Security but you should have the feeling that you're some creep in a hole somewhere that is doing something that nobody really wants to know about and not something to be proud of. And um, this requires a cultural change. So it must not be cool any longer to have access to this data. It must be something, look at that, yeah, okay, you're dealing with that kind of garbage. So you don't have too much time at your hands, haven't you? And so having fun with that is the most important thing of all because it can be got, uh, quite depressing if we, as we have seen in the first, uh, first part, but you also can have a lot of fun with these people because they know already that their job is most of the time extremely boring. So what do you think how much fun it is to stare 24 hours a week at some grainy monitor watching other people? Hmm? That's a computer. Yeah, even, even if the computer looks at the camera and uh, tries to analyze the, the phone records or whatever and the, the movement patterns, um, even then 90% of that what comes out is crap and boring and just people going on shopping or smoking a pipe or whatever. <coughs> and one thing that we can have a lot of fun with is turning the surveillance around. So there are quite a number of people that very publicly say, okay, we need more surveillance, we need more security, we need more bi biometric identification and stuff like that. Actually, we happen to have quite a bit of technology knowledge to turn all this around. So let's expose them completely, expose them in public, publish everything we know about them, let them feel what it is about to be surveillanced. So turn it around, and this can be the most funny part of all. We can be creative about that, we can have a lot of fun with that, and that's something that we should focus on so that we make sure that they are not comfortable with their stuff anymore. So, There's another piece of activism that I personally don't see done that much, and that is to make sure that we don't lose time when our luck changes. They haven't lost any time when their luck changed, and we shouldn't be either. So people that... Uh, the type of activists that do lobbying, the type of activists that write legal proposals, uh, should be writing law retractions, new laws, for when all of this shit starts backfiring on them. It's already beginning to backfire on them, and we need to be ready when it happens. We need to have legal proposals ready for our, our parliamentarians to vote upon pretty much the next day. They did, so we must do too. So we need to have a plan B when it goes the other way around. So right, I just uh, heard an interesting comment uh, on the whole topic. It said, it might be that someday it will be looked upon like the McCarthy era, where hunting communists was cool for about 10 years. And after that, everybody who was part of that hand was looked upon like, Bleh, you did that? And so it might be that we are lucky and the swing is only a few years in the future. And we need to be prepared for that day. So. We also need to use their uh, tactics if necessary. So usually how this works is they 
fire a test balloon that is an extreme proposal like forbidding, let's, let's put it the other way around. Let's say, okay, uh, we demand that all tele telecommunication surveillance is ended tomorrow or January 1st to give them a few days to adapt. So it's completely illegal. Telecommunication surveillance will be something that is totally illegal. That's our proposal. And so then we maybe settle for, okay, let's give them one more year or something like that. So they did the same thing around. So they, they wanted complete DNA um, uh, sequencing of everybody in a country. And what they got around with in the end was that they can basically get DNA uh, traces from anybody at will. So they just need some probable cause or something that simulates a probable cause. So this is the tactic that they use. It's, there are all a few other things and we need to use the same thing. We need to make impossible demands because they also do it and they get away with that. Just treat yourselves as the assistants to the prosecution in the great intelligence community inquiries of 2015. Yeah. Um, also, what I see is that our media tactics is pussyfooting. We are basically are too lame. We're saying it's a privacy violation. A, it's a data crime, nothing else. We need to name names. We need to be a bit more aggressive. We need to be able to name it as it is and not trying to be the nice looking people that have some concerns or being named the watchdog that uh, has some issues. So this is not what we need to do anymore. We need to be much more aggressive on that. May I give you well, Mike? Um, Mike's in a moment. Um, may, I, may I give you, uh, well, just ask we'll, 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 be, we'll be done in three or four minutes and then we can do a audience participation. Well, I just, just have one question, Regal. How do you, how do you think, uh, the new government, the current government will compare to the, form, uh, the former government that had, had the seat in uh, Berlin, the previous one I mean, uh, the East German for... L later, later, later. Can we do it later, about, please? In about five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another thing is they fucking up. They're having goofs every day. So we have this thing with, for instance, with the CIA trying to capture some, some guy in Italia. And uh, in the end, this whole thing completely explodes in their face. A, they have now arrest warrants for, I don't know, 20 plus CIA agents. And B, the whole surveillance infrastructure is being exposed because the police in Italy has used it against the CIA. And so everything, like how do they did analyze the traffic rec records, how did they match that with location data, how they traced it down to the hotels where these people were living, how they matched the telephone numbers to the US embassy, and so on and so on. They did everything by the book. So this is basically the, the perfect uh, case for, for this kind of investigation. And it all fires in the face. And we need to use these fuck-ups. We need to use them to make our case. And um, we need to show that the laws that they are introducing to prevent us, uh, to protect us from terrorism are actually more dangerous than the terrorism itself. So, and that, that is the, the real issue here, convincing at least, if not the greater public, then the people who are thinking about this, uh, these things and uh, having at least some consciousness left uh, to get them onto these issues. Um, yeah, another thing is all of these, a lot of these contracts in the security industry are driven by personal greed. So there are a lot of people earning a lot of money on that and almost all of it has some illegal angle on that. And as soon as something happens in this area, we need to also be on that and put that to journalists and make, make sure that it's exposed all over the place. So because a lot of that stuff simply doesn't make even sense, even if you would assume that the terrorism protection would be the real issue because of a lot of the security measures that are introduced are not even making security even a little bit better. So. Yeah, uh, there's a whole chapter here, a little chapter uh, that we call the Asimov Foundation Strategies. Let's assume for a moment that the intelligence apparatus is in fact turned against, turned against anybody that dissents with the government. Frank Church, uh, I think he was a U.S. senator who was um, investigating the intelligence community in 1975 over the COINTELPRO program that the FBI and the NSA had set up in the US to spy on its own population. Basically, 
went into the intelligence community to find out what their capabilities were and came away looking slightly white in the face. Um, and he said some interesting things. I think one of his quotes was that if this was ever turned on the American people, don't quote me on the exact words, but if, if this great machinery is ever turned on the American people in, in the event of any kind of dictatorship, uh, there would be no chance of ever opposing it. And I think his 1975 predictions are upon us today. Um, so given that this is possibly happening, given that this may even be happening to us, I've been speaking to some people from America that are saying that they're already noticing that this is upon them. They're noticing their friends getting arrested for obvious, uh, uh, obviously through telephone taps, much more widespread than they've ever seen through traffic analysis. Um, if this is upon us, we may want to develop actual strategies to make sure that our knowledge and our experience can transcend the current carriers of it, can transcend uh, us, actively recruit new people into our own culture, which is what we've been doing all along, make sure we transfer this knowledge and the experience, write it down, uh, master apprentice structures, which also function if people get arrested, if people get interrogated, uh, basically prepare for situations that may not be as friendly as the world that we live in today. Yeah, so that, that is basically the message, is that we may have a few months or years left preparing for the worst. It might not happen if we are lucky, but I doubt that we are lucky. So we really need to think about what we are doing now, how things must change, what roads of action we need to pursue, and what battles, battles are worth fighting for that we can win and have fun with. So because if you think for the long run, you're only doing stuff for quite a while if it makes fun. If it's getting boring, dangerous, and it's not even the last bit funny, then you stop doing it. And so we need to keep this fun factor always in mind. I think uh, that was it from us. Yeah, that was it from us, sort of. Um, let's go to a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I have <laughs> one, one question for, for, for you that I just want to have you raise your heads. So who of you believes that we can turn things around, that it will be, let's say, as good as 1997 again? Okay, at least a few. <laughs> Thanks. Not entirely hopeless. <laughs> okay, let's first do the question that's already asked. What do we think of the, of the, uh, the present government as opposed to the last one here in Berlin? I think it's quite obvious things are not getting any better. Yeah, uh, you, you, you're I was comparing it with, uh, well, there are two previous governments in Berlin. I mean, the East German and the one before that. Uh, that's... Uh, the fascist government. How, do, how would the current government compare with those? Well, I think, I think a lot of the technology that we, that we have today is Erich Honecker and, and Milke's wet dream. They were, <laughs> Very they, were, wet. they were laughed at when they were registering all the typewriters. People were laughing. How can they dare to register all the typewriters? Because they wanted to look at a piece of paper and see who typed it. Every printer today prints its serial number, and the Dutch police is already saying, we're using that successfully to get to the buyer of a specific printer every time. And nobody's laughing. So in terms of technology, certainly things have advanced a lot. In terms of politics, uh, it's difficult to say. At least we can sit here and say what we think, which we couldn't do in the last previous two governments. Um, so well, that's the... That's, in, that's in, the, in, the, in the 30s or previous century, in the 30s or the previous century, you could still say what you want in Berlin. But then came the fire in the Reichstag. Uh, yes, so but comparable with something that happened in New I York. I think I think Maybe. it, I think Maybe. it, I think it really doesn't really bring us forward comparing that. So I think the. Well, it's. Maybe let's let's go to some, some I other think questions it's, because uh, this, I don't want this to be a debate between you and us yes. here. Maybe let's go on with further questions. Go ahead over yeah. there. Uh, well, okay. Um, regarding your question uh, of hope, if there's still some hope left, I might just have some kind of a remark. Um, the thing is, I have a problem with the title of this talk that says that we have lost the war. Um, I mean, we I realize. That, yeah, we. I realize we have lost a couple of battles, as you say that as well. Um, I'm just somehow convinced that we've not been at war 
like in the way that everyone is on the uproar and everyone is really convinced that we have to change something. We have not joined forces with all the other splinters in this society all over the world that tr struggle for basically the same thing, that, but they don't have the possibilities as we have. We are the ones that shape the future. We have the possibilities, possibilities to affect what technology is like, and technology is, what, driving, is what, dri what is driving our future. So it is upon us, and it is our responsibility, more than most other groups, to take influence on this in a way that is moral, and constrained oh, uh, only by moral and not by the state. Amen. Well, if we've been demotivating in any way, and, 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 and I think, uh, then that is not the idea here. The idea no, no. is not to be demotivating, but the idea is to impress upon the people that at least keep talking to me that something fundamentally has changed over the past five years. And so that, that we really need to do what you say, okay. that we really need to hook up with people who, who want to change society for the better, and that we, need, that we are the ones who have the tools to maintain the breathing space for them. And yes, that yeah, that too. But that also, we need to realize that, that the, the space that we have to, to perform this activism in, the space that we have to do these changes has shrunk, and, and that we need to all realize this. Yes. Okay. Go, go ahead. Um, okay, I don't know who's in yeah. line, but I'll just take it. So I really wanted to thank you all for uh, bringing this, this topic up, and um, one of your uh, things, the things you said is all the other organizations that we could work with. And I really think that's, that's a call for a more, getting more politically active, and that's a very good thing. One thing, uh, though, I'd like to take issue with is one of the suggestions you made about um, the technologies. And um, the te te technologies you mentioned are ex really the ones that this group probably has a lot of knowledge about, which is cryptography and all that kind of stuff. But these are basically evasive tactics. It's hiding. It's not progressive. It's not. It's not. It's not what you ask for in the later part. Uh, humor, jamming, in-your-face attitude. What I would call that. And this is. I think some of this might we be need because um, there is some technology that's coming that's behind all these new developments that we actually don't know that much about. Well, there's groups that know much more about it. And that's machine learning. That's computer vision. That's surveillance technology. And I would really like to well, state that I think these technologies are getting much more important and that we as a hacker group have very little knowledge about all that and that we should change that and should get into these things. And they are very interesting and cool and it's really hot stuff. It's, I mean, it's fun. Yeah. And uh, so if everyone, um, anybody who doesn't really know what to study yet get into these kind of things. I, I agree, but you need both. Uh, for instance, if you want to pop up somewhere and do something funny and open and out in your face, you may want to prepare for it in a way that they're not expecting. And the only way to prepare for something in a way that they're not expecting it is if you can use cryptography to do the preparations. So even if you do something completely out in the open, you may still want the element of surprise. Um, I have one minor point and a bigger one. Uh, the minor one is you asked for people to please raise their hand if they believe that change was possible in the next few years. You didn't ask a second question, which is, which people uh, don't, because there would still be a group that wouldn't raise their hand at all, amongst them me. So suddenly you get a much bleaker picture of the atmosphere in the whole room than you might have gotten. That's one. The second is, I, the both of you talked about they quite a lot. They have um, a proposal already the next day in Parliament. Uh, they are vying for DNA sequencing they want to have cameras in their own street. But you're all talking about different days at the same time. The first they who have the proposals ready is people in parliament. The they who want data sequencing is both scientists and some lobbyists and some politicians. The they who want cameras in the street are people. And lumping it all in one doesn't make the issue any clearer. Actually, actually you're sort of modifying it into almost something that verges on the um, well, the, the, the big um, theory. You're, so you're absolutely I, right. I, I don't think that's helping. Yeah, I, 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 I want to start at one example. Um, well, you know it from my own studies in this um, Dutch patient records. Um, suddenly, we are getting, we, the Dutch, are getting this electronic um, metric ID card. 
Um, but that was very much a card in search of a function, which is this electronic array. But it's not that there was this master plan to um, um, give all of us those cards and they've just been waiting for the opportunity to do so, as in there was this giant master plan behind it. It's just, hap it's just as haphazardly as we suddenly, oh, you and I talk and then I say something, you say something, and the third of us gets this bright idea. That's what's happening in other areas as well. And suddenly you turn it into a sort of complot. Which, okay. No. You're absolutely right. I, I normally, when I speak of they, I, I, I say something very much along these lines that is very hard to define a they. Uh, on the other hand, somebody did have all these laws ready in all these different countries. And these may be different groups. These may be pressure groups inside the Ministry of the Interior. These may be, uh, it's sometimes very hard to say who is they. It's just very easy to see when you're confronted with a, with a, a pan-European and very well-defined strategy. And it's very hard to think of any other word than, than they. Um, having that said, uh, uh, I do believe a lot of it is indeed haphazard. A lot of it is indeed uh, chance, but a lot of it isn't also. The Dutch uh, uh, movement to register where all the vehicles and all the people are going has been going for seven years, and it's basically been this answer looking for a problem. They've been wanting cameras that register license plates for, for logging who drives where for the past 12 years, 13 years. And first it was a... Uh, no, when, I'm, when the I'm sorry, you, you're doing it again. The they... But please let, let, me, let, me, let, me the, the people, let me elaborate. The, the people in that street that you talked about that want cameras might not be the same they who want to have electronic uh, um, uh, identity cards. Granted. That same people might have... And you're sort of clarif not clarifying that if you call everybody they. Yeah, that, that doesn't might, help. That you're, might be the case, but... Yeah. You're but absolutely yeah. right. I'm, I'm, I'm using the they here for a sense of bravi brevity. Uh, let, me, let me quickly go into this road pricing thing. This has been a, a sort of a, a traveling answer to, to various problems. Uh, when, when, the, uh, in, uh, when the wall fell, uh, uh, it, was, it was there to prevent cars from, that were being stolen in Holland from making it to Poland. Uh, then it became, uh, when, when road safety was an issue, it became a, a, a thing for catching speeders. Then it was a taxation thing. Then it was a road pricing thing when, when we started having too many traffic jams. Uh, and I believe that there is a fraction with the Ministry of the Interior, with Justice, that has wanted a log of which car went where consistently over the past 15 years. And that not all of it has, is haphazard, not all of it is chance. But a lot of it is. Never attribute to malice what can be, what can be uh, sufficiently explained by stupidity. Uh, yeah, but, but at least, at least in, I have some counterexamples to that. So um, at least in the, in the area of, uh, for instance, uh, telecommunication surveillance, uh, we see a very clear trend that industry is providing solutions way before the demand is there in terms of, of laws and that there is a strategic coalition between politicians, industry, intelligence, security, uh, community, uh, that is driving that, that thing, laws, European directives, and so on and so on. And so what is happening in the, at the EU level is not haphazard. That this, nobody can tell me that. It's not just happening. This is 15 people who know each other for 15 years, sitting in a back room, making a deal. So this, if, if there ever was a secret government, then it's in Brussels in the back rooms right now. So, and. Steini. I would go a step further in the they question. I guess there is no big difference between they and we, we in terms of the technicians, the freaks, the techies, because uh, we got all that fucking technician ideas. Yeah, we are their technical brain. So we tell them, hey, take care with that technology. One could do that or that. And they think, hey, cool, good idea. We should do that. Yeah? And we, te we, we tell them, hmm, cameras, hmm, hmm, what ones could do with that cameras? And, hey, brilliant idea. Let's do that. So we always should know that we are their strongest weapon in that war. And for every poison you event, invent an anti-poison in somehow. I don't know how to do it, but always keep it in mind. This is the one first step to accept and to understand that we are part of the problem, not only part of the solution.
Um, do you consider it possible to, to overfill these uh, collecting databases uh, because there are a limited amount of disk space even in the future and uh, limited amounts of uh, processing time for, mm -hmm. for profiles? No, I don't think that's realistic. I've, I've joked about uh, making a small script that uh, turns my whole hard disk into encrypted email headers so I can put my whole hard disk in backup on the data retention stores. Uh, <laughs> So in reality, in reality uh, uh, this, the whole romantic notion of, of hackers or just random people clogging up all the databases with false information, uh, I don't think makes much of a difference. Data mining is very good about filtering out noise, especially if it's random enough. So, so, so fucking with their algorithms might be possible. That might be something worth considering. So if you know what spe specific algorithms, for instance, is being used in an automatic video surveillance system, um, then playing around with that algorithm to get certain results, for instance, false alarms based on I don't know what toys, uh, that might be possible, but uh, filling up the, the communication surveillance databases, I think it's just a few Perl scripts away to filter that noise out so, or whatever they use. We have loyalty systems for the supermarkets, as I'm sure they have everywhere, and in the beginning of that, people were saying, well, you should just swap these cards around because that's much easier. Uh, because then uh, they will just get all this false information in the database and you can still get the discount. Uh, and then we, we sat down with a few people and we just calculated how easy it would be to match where the card went because you just see record swapping. Uh, and you could then not only know what you bought, but you would also know who you knew and who you swapped cards with and you would get a very quick database of who is how active in the movement of evading loyalty cards as a bonus on top of knowing what you buy. So there's, no, as, as, in a short answer, I don't think poisoning the databases, inserting rubbish is all too effective of a strategy. It may be effective in the minds of people, it may be effective in the, in, in the, in the, in the brains of the people that want to do something. And as, as, a, as, a, as a symbolic gesture, it may be worthwhile, but, but in practice, against people doing real data mining, I don't see it, it offering much of a, of a solution. Well, I was, uh, one last, uh, please. Yes. Um, I was thinking about it because uh, from my point of view, there are a lot of uh, organized retired people and uh, I know that some of them aren't very happy with their new passports, for example, because uh, face recognition has problems with old people. And I could imagine about maybe a hundred or several hundred old people f kind of making a human brute force attack to, to, to some passport check station and just uh, going there with all their passports and they won't work until the system shows, has to show that it's not up to the job. That's always good. Showing that it's not up to the job, showing that there is technical failure is never bad. It, it, it seems to me that everything you've described, which I think are a bunch of really good ideas and I'd like to help as far as I can, but it seems to me that it's all very reactive. It's reacting to several agendas being set by other people. And, and, and therefore, I think if, if we just keep in that mode, reacting with all our cleverness and ideals to other agendas, that then probably we will already have lost the war. And um, it seems to me that well, a lot of... Uh, point. Well, going, going on, the, on the offensive, I mean, we still have a lot of people in the US, but even in the Netherlands, for instance, that believe that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11, and if he didn't, well, then maybe he did have weapons of mass destruction, and if he didn't, well, at least he was a very nasty guy, so it's good as he's gone. And this is considered by many Dutch people, true story, a justification for killing 150,000 Iraqi civilians. And, 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 and one of the reasons that many people appear to believe this is that because they haven't been, you know, told about stuff like the Downing Street memos that show that Tony Blair and Bush knew full well in the summer of 2002 that the whole weapons of mass destruction story was bullshit. So why do most people don't know it? Why do most people in this room probably even have never heard of the Downing Street memos? Well, one of the reasons is because many others of us haven't told them. And so go back to the basis where all this crap began, which is Iraq, which is 9-11 of but which there are reactive, many big stories that are full of holes, yeah, but, full of holes. But that is, that is basically even more reactive because you're trying to correct the perception of the past against a huge propaganda machine. So I don't really see that wasting your time or time on but that is really as productive. Long as, as long as the myth of, of Iraq and the myth of 9-11 continues to exist, then it will continue to be used to enforce these laws. And most of the populace will actually happily go along with it. 
they, they will always find terrorism on demand. If we debunk the Iraq myth or the 9-11 stuff or whatever, there will always be something new. That's, that's basically the, their I, basic. I still, I still think it's worthwhile yeah. to, to keep pointing out that these are myths. And I, I, you, you can make a really funny story about 9-11, how 19 Muslim fundamentalists that apparently like lap dances because they visited Las Vegas all the time were somehow able to defeat the entire US air defense with box cutters. I mean, this is a funny story if you look at it like this way. Yeah, OK. All okay. right. Sorry, so I, I really have to have to say that the lady was quite correct. I think it's a construction between we and they, and I think this construction does not work out. Only it does only work out if you really want this construction. So I think there's there's this uh, this as Steini pointed out. There's there's it's it's always a mixture between we and they, on the one hand. And the next point is here. Uh, we have to talk about consciousness. It's about consciousness of the people. And uh, for example, we are the kind of top of the top here. And uh, the discussion we had in the last few years about photo taking photographs here is really weak. It's a weak discussion. And it was slightly going on. But nowadays, it's just established. And I'm pretty sure that the war, which will be or the, the, the battles which will be lost over and over again in the next few years will be, this war will also change with our consciousness behind it. And I'm very sorry that, that you were talking mostly about kind of technologies and about a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of battle which was a kind of uh, 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 taking one step further and one ste uh, step back on the other side. It's, for me, it's a question about consciousness. And I, I'm, I, I'm, I really, uh, this is, this fails, or this, this is uh, not uh, matched in this discussion here. I'm, uh, I feel sorry about this. Um, uh, okay. I, just, I just want to add one, one thing to that. Um, we have a number of, let's say, hard points that we used to defend over the years. And some of them has, we have simply, even if we would want them to be true, we simply cannot do it anymore. And insisting on them borders on fundamentalism. So, and that is something, if you're, for instance, there are people around here that always wanted to be mailbox systems or to be our communication system. And they got overrun by the internet. And we need to be very careful that this, this is not happening again to us. So that we are basically up to what the technology takes on and where we are going the technology wise and to simply accept at some point that we cannot stop the train of technology, we can just try to direct it somehow. And so fighting yesterday's battle under the, the label of consciousness, I don't know if that really is productive on that. The thing, the thing is, um, if people fighting nuclear transports or if people uh, uh, doing activism in a, think, in a way that I think is meaningful, tell me that they are beginning to feel the force of, of interception, that they're beginning to feel the force of traffic analysis, that they're beginning to feel that our generation is, is gaining power in the intelligence community, that they're no longer dealing with this guy in the dark coat that comes to meetings, but that they're dealing with high tech in, in, in foiling what they're trying to do. Then for me, that's not a, a, a question of consciousness. That's just a real strategic issue. That, that we need to deal with. And, and, and I'm sorry if that's all about technology. For me, that's just a matter of living in the world of today and, and facing the challenges that we face. I, yeah. <laughs> ah, there. Yeah. Uh, I hope this is working. I, I, I think we are doing the same mistakes again. We are talking about technology and we are talking about fun. I think, in my opinion, more important is that we have to talk to the ordinary John on Jane Doe, people who don't understand technology, like my brother, and we have to explain what's happening in their language, not in our language. That's a problem. Then, otherwise, it's a discussion that we are doing together, but we have to broaden our knowledge, and that means we have to change our language. Okay. I think I think we should identify our profit centers and focus on core business and that is talking about technology and fun because that's what we do really well. And 
respectfully, if I might, I yeah, think... But tell, it doesn't work. It didn't work. So we have to change something. I would not say that it didn't work. So if you look at Germany, for instance, we managed to keep Germany, at least from a European perspective, uh, in a state where there are at least privacy laws, where there are mm -hmm. protections for encryption, where there are possibilities to do stuff that are not possible in other countries. For instance, we can still re-engineer stuff here in Germany. And so I would not say that it has not worked. So it is true that we are basically at the end of our wits in some of these cases because the forces on the other side are simply too strong. But uh, I agree we need to talk to more people and we need to work on our, for instance, media stuff so that we reach more people. You're precisely correct on that. I come from a, from a situation where we're talking the language of Jane and John Doe uh, is a little bit of a dangerous issue. Because I, I come from a situation where the vast majority, possibly as many as 75% of the people, want more repression. They're petitioning the government to give them the boot in the neck faster. Uh, and harder. And harder. Uh, why is it that we still have any freedom? Doesn't the government realize? Doesn't the minister know that terrorists and criminals are using these freedoms, abusing them? Why is there still this crazy concept, concept of constitution? So we have to accept, or at least me coming from the Netherlands, I have to accept that I am the, major, the minority. I am the minority that still cares about these things. There's plenty of other people, but we are a minority. And I'm not sure whether that's true in here in Germany. I hope not, but it could well be. So go, see a microphone, please. I, I, I if, um, yes, if I may. This guy was. Yeah. You're talking about people who want more security. You're talking about the powerful political powers that be. But I think that one key thing which we have failed to do is to make the people who elect the powerful um, Senate, the powerful whatever, realize that you are not really in danger. You who live in a town of 1,000 people and are one of the most afraid people of terrorism in the world are not in danger and that what is coming in terms of technological changes is far more dangerous. And we need a way to say that in a clear manner, not just privacy policies and, you know, 1984, go read the book. We need a way that people can understand that danger is coming. Absolutely. Um, the, the angel here around me said that I'm, I would be next. Uh, I, I agree with the last war issue, and I think that it is Im embedded in an even bigger, much bigger context where people's interests are being betrayed by politicians which care most about uh, global corporate interests. And we know that the situation in, in Germany is especially, already especially critical due to the high unemployment level. And um, people are also more and more distrusting um, of all parties. And um, you have said it, what happened in the Netherlands and how um, right-wing uh, parties got support by, by this. Um, so uh, shall, we found a, if, if, um, shall we create a CCC party? Of course not with, with that uh, name, but uh, uh, I mean, no. I we don't know what, what, what can happen in, in the future, and if someone mm. would like to talk a bit more about this, um, I would be here in, in front. Thank you. So um, my personal opinion on this is that um, hackers as a cultural group are politically quite diverse. So they are, even if you're talking about non-Euclidean politics, uh, we have about this spectrum of opinions, and so I think what we should focus on is providing the tools to people who try to do political change. So each of us might have his political ideas and his political activism, and what we are calling for is providing the tools, providing the knowledge, enabling change. So, and that's, that's basically the, the, the core message here. So having something like a CCC party is something that I consider a bit strange, but okay. Well, it's kind of ironical, but what do you think about uh, this in the Demons Netherlands support. context? Um, my personal thoughts are the country is screwed, it's fucked, it's... Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, uh, may be a real good country to live again, again 15 years from now, is my personal opinion. It's, it's very interesting, it's like living in a laboratory, because uh, 
we are seeing a lot of the technologies which will be seen all over Europe. We're seeing them early, and we're seeing them deployed in a country that doesn't ask too many questions. So it's, it's, it's like living in, in, a, in a laboratory. Um, I want to pass the final word to, to Fefe and then close it off because we're already too late. Um, yeah, several things. The first thing is that I think our biggest mistake is that we don't play to our strength, but we, we meet and have fun and talk about this and that, but we need to realize, first of all, we are the few people who actually understand the technology. So we need to use that and communicate that, but not to the people directly, but to the media. Um, in Germany, we had the, the good... Um, we are the media. Yeah, no, not, not directly. The, the census, which was one of the watersheds in, in German law against... Um, data collection and retention was um, basically the media running rampant and most of the technology that's happening and that's um, going against our civil rights is not happening to minimize the civil rights but it's happening and then the effect is to minimize civil rights. Most of the the things we can see in, in this, the talks at the Congress was actually something of like like subvention uh, or industry förderung. So basically, they had some money to spend to make the the industry better, and we weren't there to present our part, our com our companies to invest in. So they invested in the companies that were there, and those companies had biometrics. So the next time they have money to spend, please go there with crypto phone and. Yeah, and this is one thing I wanted to already add to Fife's um, talk before then, we're fighting the war. You said, we ha do we have hope left? We're fighting the war differently than we should. We should not take defensive action or fight symptoms. We should have a concept how to do it otherwise and represent the concept offensively so we can change some things in the future. And the last thing I wanted to like to annotate is that about the we and they problem. Look at the problem of the people who grown up with Horkheimer and Adorno and believed in freedom and that look where the people sit now and where these things, how these things ended up. And you will see that I hope we don't change the way they did and we stay in our moral beliefs. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's... I think... Okay, Ani, what's now? I think that there's a problem that people can be bought. So everyone who knows something about technology will be bought by the industry. Okay, and but, but, but the point is, if we need to identify an enemy, because that's more easy, they are the security advisors of the people in power. So it would be a good thing if we would be them, but the point is, then we need to be maybe even more proactive in supporting security concepts without surveillance. I mean, maybe we should be more security advisoring in this respect. In as an alternative interesting suggestions to, all As an alternative to see all these um, Machiavellic, Darwinistic assholes providing fascism with technology as a business. So. Okay, we really gotta wrap it up because we're late. Thank you very much and bye-bye.